Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless We begin in Israel where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says a credible military threat is the best way to deter Iran's nuclear ambitions. He noted that it becomes harder to do, though, when the wait becomes longer. Netanyahu is speaking just days after reports surfaced that Iran had increased its uranium enrichment to 84 percent, leaving only a small gap before it hit its weapon-grade production at 90 percent. Let's bring in I-24 News Middle East correspondent Ariel Osaran joining us live in studio. Good morning to you. Benjamin Netanyahu speaking about Iran's nuclear ambitions. This is not the first time or the last that Israel will speak about Iran's nuclear capabilities. But why is it different this time? Indeed, Hamda. So uh, we're, we're looking at is this is perhaps the the first major statement by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu since reassuming office of outlining how he sees Israel's strategy towards Iran, towards its nuclear program, especially amid the reports that Iran is just 6% below weapons grade uh, in enrichment levels. This comes as the nuclear talks, uh, indirect talks in Vienna between world powers and Iran stalled already. The Americans are saying that it's dead in the water, it's irrelevant with everything else that's going on with Iran. And what Netanyahu is trying to do here is he's trying to put the, the, the threat, the, the military threat that is on the table already, it has been on the table. He's trying to emphasize that this is where things are going given that talks in Vienna are stalled. Let's take a listen to uh, what what uh, part of what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said yesterday at the Hartog National Security Conference in Tel Aviv. The only thing that has credibly stopped rogue nations from developing nuclear weapons is a credible military threat or a credible military action. You can couple that with crippling economic sanctions, but that's not a sufficient condition. A necessary condition and often a sufficient condition is credible military action. The longer you wait, the harder that becomes. We've waited very long. In any case, I can tell you that I will do everything in my power to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. That is not merely an Israeli interest, it's an American interest, it's in the interest of the entire world. So not only, as he says, uh, is it in the interest of the entire world, but he also gives a historical kind of outlining of, of how rec uh, previous threats that uh, only with a, uh, a credible military threat or military action were these programs thwarted. Ask a question, how do you stop a rogue nation from acquiring nuclear weapons? You have to ask yourself that. Well, let's see. I mean, there have been some examples so we can maybe deduce uh, a rule. Well, you had one that's called uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, Iraq. It was stopped by military force, ours. You had a second one that is called uh, uh, Syria that tried to develop nuclear weapons, and it was stopped by a military action, ours. There was uh, a third country, uh, Muammar Gaddafi's Libya. It wanted to pursue nuclear weapons, and it gave it up by uh, the threat of a military action. He's talking about the 1981 strike, on, uh, Israeli strike on the Iraqi uh, nuclear facility, as well as in 2007 against the Syrian power plant. Now, Libya dropped its uh, pursuit of nuclear weapons d out of fear, according to Netanyahu, out of fear of a credible U.S. threat. There were also reports in recent weeks about <clears throat> secret meetings that the prime minister held with the security establishment in which they decided to ramp up preparations and readiness to strike it on. What do we know there? Right, Hamda. So this is based on a report last night on Israel's Channel 12. Uh, it didn't. It, it, it didn't attribute the report to any 
and the uh, official, but it's talking about uh, at least five meetings that Prime Minister Netanyahu held over the past few weeks with the top of Israel's security establishment, the defense minister, the chief of military, head of the Mossad, national security, head of uh, military intel and other uh, relevant units in the army, talking about ramping up preparation and plans for a military strike. Now, this is a, a, a shift that we've seen uh, about like f four or five months ago where it was believed that the diplomatic avenue is not going to re reach anywhere. Israel, there were saying that there's about a year from being able to carry out such a strike. There was also criticism by the previous government that when Netanyahu was in power, there was no proper plans in place. This appears to be attempts to try and show that Israel is preparing for it, multiple meetings. And in the report, it also stated that what was in those meetings, Netanyahu also briefed uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, as well as French President Emmanuel Macron in their previous meetings. A long forgotten prophecy that has recently been rediscovered by Bill Salas may enlighten us about the fate of Iran's current nuclear aspirations as we read in Jeremiah 49, 34-37. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow, which might imply that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps will be unable to launch scores of its missiles at its enemies. Additionally, he declares that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Bushehr nuclear reactor, located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah continues in verses 36 and 37. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds, there shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. Jeremiah informs that the attack upon the ancient territory of Elam will produce numerous refugees, perhaps even turning into a humanitarian crisis. Exiles will be dispersed worldwide as if being blown about by overpowering winds. In addition to the Lord, Iran has enemies in this prophecy. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Additionally, Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. Meanwhile, Israeli media reported that Netanyahu held a series of secret discussions with Israel's top security brass aimed at ramping up preparations and readiness for a possible Israeli strike on Iran's nuclear program. The result of the meetings, according to the report, that Israel will act alone if the international community does not step in. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zechariah goes on to tell us in verse 6 that God will use the Israeli defense forces to destroy the Muslim nations that seek their destruction. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a firepan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time.
Historic storm slamming the West before marching across the country. Millions of people in California getting some temporary relief from the wild weather, but another round is on the way. Take a look at this picture posted by the Pasadena Fire Department after a mud flow damaged this garage. A busy day for them as they also pulled off a swift water rescue, hoisting a person to safety from the rushing water. Southern California getting hit by record rainfall, nearly 10 inches in some places and more than six feet of snow in the mountains. ABC's Zareen Shaw has more from Los Angeles. Zareen, good morning. We are at the LA River on a normal day. This river is just a trickle, but this is not a normal day. And now Los Angeles is bracing for a second storm system that hits tomorrow. The historic storm system here in the west pummeled the region, battering Southern California with torrential rains and heavy snow, knocking down trees and leaving some 80,000 customers without power. This satellite image shows the massive storm swirling over southwestern California. At higher elevations, Californians seeing heavy snow, forcing roads across the state to close. But down below, intense downpours causing flash flooding. In Valencia, several motorhomes and trees falling into the Santa Clara River after an embankment in a local RV park began crumbling and collapsing. So I haven't been able to get uh, back and forth to work for a couple of days, and also I'm just kind of afraid we're going to have to evacuate if it gets any worse. A county helicopter surveyed the roads and waterways and later came across the RVs that had fallen into the river. This person stood on top of their Porsche on this flooded portion of the Interstate 5. The unusually sunny streets of Los Angeles County covered in snow. Other parts of the county being blanketed with sleet and wintry mix. Recovery and clearing efforts already underway after the storm's strong winds knocked down dozens of trees, crushing cars throughout the city and even homes. This tree in Burbank smashing into a bedroom. In Pixley, a levee broke, leading to heavy flooding, shutting down Highway 99. Some people abandoning their cars. There are three vehicles down there right now. They are stuck in the uh, mud water. Uh, no one was hurt. We were able to extract everyone from those vehicles, uh, and they were all out safely. In the mountains, whiteout conditions in Big Bear Lake, with many visitors trapped due to the onslaught of the snow. A very scary situation, and this weather is still having a big impact on power outages. In Michigan, nearly 315,000 customers are without power. That is the most out of any state. And here in California, nearly 80,000 customers are without power. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for not recognizing the signs of his first coming, as we read in Matthew 16, 1 through 3. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. The religious leaders of Jesus' day had full knowledge of the prophecies of the Messiah. Yet these religious leaders ignored the signs and still rejected him. If the religious leaders of Jesus' day missed the signs of Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to pay close attention to the signs of Jesus' second coming? We began this morning with nasty weather all across the country. We're talking about snow in California, a dust bowl in Texas, and a record-breaking tornado outbreak in Oklahoma that has left tens of thousands without power. That's where Omar Villafranca is for us. Omar, good morning. What are you seeing there? Good morning. We're getting a first-hand look at the power of this storm, and we happen to find a little vein here, a little path of destruction. Check this out behind me. You've got a red Jeep that was tossed onto another car. It's right in front of a house. It's missing most of its roof. Now, this storm last night, it was loud. It was moving fast, and it was all part of a wild night of weather here on the South Plains. Everybody okay you in there? Powerful tornadoes ripped across Oklahoma overnight tearing roofs off homes and flipping over trucks. All of a sudden, it like felt like, like a bomb hit outside or something. The whole house kind of shifted. At least eight tornadoes touched down in the state, the highest ever recorded in the month of February. And the garage moved, and the next thing I know, it was gone. It was done, like three seconds flat. In the Oklahoma City area alone, several twisters topple chimneys, crumple siding, and sent debris flying into the air. Chelsea Riley said the wind shattered the window right next to her 10-year-old daughter's bed. She threw her blanket over her head, and she waited for me to come get her. 
her brother came screaming to her rescue and I pushed him in the bathroom. She said she left them in the bathroom as she raced to find her two other children, ages five and six. When the wind calmed down, she saw just how much damage there was. There were shingles everywhere, fence panels broken. We jumped in the car and tried to leave, and as I'm trying to get out of my driveway, things are broken everywhere. What in the world is that? The dangerous system also slammed Kansas. At least two tornadoes were confirmed in the state. And it brought golf ball sized hail to Texas. He shouldn't be out in this weather. And spun up dust storms in the panhandle, turning the sky yellow. It's the same storm system that dumped historic rain and snow on the West Coast over the weekend. Hundreds of drivers were stranded on the icy and snowy roads as freeways came to a standstill. In the Sierra, drivers are being warned to stay off the roads, with near whiteout conditions expected over the next two days. We've already shoveled this multiple times. <sighs> No one was killed here in Norman, but there are reports of several people that were injured. Right now, about 14,000 customers are without power here in Oklahoma, but once the sun comes up, we'll get a, a better idea of the extent of this damage. We are living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. God in his grace and mercy is warning the world of his impending judgment. The Bible refers to this judgment as the tribulation in which God will pour out his wrath on an unbelieving an unrepentant world. I have had many people ask the question, how do you know Jesus is returning? And why is today any different than any other time in history? Jesus gives his followers the answer to that question in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Jesus told his followers that there would be a convergence of Bible prophecy right before his return. Notice Jesus said, when these things begin to happen. Jesus used the plural word things, meaning when you see multiple prophecies converging at the same time, that his return was at the doors, as we read in Matthew 24, 33. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. There can be no denying all these things are beginning to take place. The next question is, how soon is the rapture of the church? The war in Ukraine entering its second year this weekend. Intense fighting reported over a key city in Ukraine that's been pounded into rubble as Russia shuts down a major oil pipeline to Poland. ABC's Patrick Rival joins us now from Kiev. There are also growing concerns that China is preparing to play a more assertive role in helping Russia. But in Ukraine, the focus is on that eastern city of Bakhmut, which Russia has been trying to take for months and where Ukrainian forces position is difficult. This morning, Ukraine in a desperate fight to hold the key eastern city of Bakhmut as Russian forces claim to be advancing in the bloodiest battle of the war so far. Video released by Russian state media showing the devastation there. Ukraine's top ground forces commander in the city, helping personally direct the defense. Both sides believed to have already suffered thousands of casualties, according to Ukrainians fighting on the ground. But Ukraine saying it is holding the line for now. The battle raging as overnight Russia shut down its largest oil pipeline to Poland. One day after Poland delivered the first Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. The modern Leopards are an important upgrade for Ukrainian troops currently using Soviet-era tanks intended to help Ukraine prepare for a spring offensive. Vladimir Klitschko, the former heavyweight boxer and brother of Kyiv's mayor, showing one off. Thank you, Germany. Thank you, the free world for all what you do for us, Ukrainians. But on the diplomatic front, a growing clash between China and Western countries over Ukraine. China at a G20 summit this morning, siding with Russia and refusing to sign a joint statement condemning the war. The USS Nimitz is breathtaking to behold, a floating city of 5,000 sailors. When we first landed on a C-2 Greyhound, we watched hundreds of sailors. Their uniforms color-coded. Red, yellow, green, purple, and brown, each defining critical jobs to refuel, arm, and launch aircraft. We met America's best trained pilots who say this mission is a new challenge. This is unlike anything the U.S. Navy has done since World War II. That may be the case. I'll tell you this. It, we are here to stay, right, in the South China Sea and in this part of the world. And I think that's the message that we really want to convey to, the, to not only 
China, but the entire world. Lieutenant Commander David Ash, call sign Skittles, is an F-18 pilot. We were flying and conducting our routine missions and interacting with, uh, for instance, the, the People's Liberation Army Navy. We are very close to them physically, but we're also very close uh, to a potential conflict if one of one, either they or we misbehave or mismanage our aircraft. These close calls happen on a nearly daily basis over the South China Sea. This one in December when a Chinese fighter jet came within 20 feet of an American plane. Does that affect how you train? It makes it more real. If something were to happen in this part of the world with a near peer adversary, the consequences uh, from a loss of material, hardware, and, and personnel would be incredible. They would be devastating. And that's why these dozens of F-18s aboard here don't stop taking off. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. John 15, 18 through 20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Reports indicate that the Chinese Communist Party has escalated their persecution of Christians um, in this past year. The U.S.-based organization China Aid says, quote, by using the new measures against religion content online and the infamous zero COVID policy, authorities limited or eliminated Christian gatherings. The watchdog group adding the regime is increasingly demanding worship and allegiance to Chinese President Xi Jinping. Here to react, the Federalist senior contributor, Helen Rally. What should this persecution, this increase in Christian persecution in China tell us about what's happening in China right now and specifically what the Chinese government is up to? This report really saddens me and my yes. heart goes out to all the Christians, brothers and sisters in China. And this report also shows the true nature of the Communist Party. Communist Party has a long history of persecuting all people of faith, and especially since Xi Jinping came into power, that he intensified the persecution of all religious believers because he demands absolute and unconditional loyalty. But I also believe it has an element of uh, related to China's economy because Xi's zero COVID policy has severely damaged China's economy. Uh, China reported its economy only grew about 3% last year. So as, you, as we know, uh, slow growth means less uh, revenue for the government and Xi needs the money to uh, finance his geopolitical ambitions such as continuing support Russia economic support as well as military support and prepare invading Taiwan. He's going after the churches not only for ideological reasons but also he's going after the church's asset which is horrifying and you know just despicable and so we should recognize their true nature and praying and demand the protections for our Christian brothers and sisters in China. People, by the way, don't understand that if you're under the age of 18 in China, you are legally not allowed to attend a church, which shows you what their motive is to not allow kids to grow up in a church and have that foundation. But also this COVID policy is a lesson to us. They use COVID lockdown um, to limit the churches because so many people were meeting in homes because the churches 
were um, more likely to be surveilled uh, so they could use COVID policy to crack down. And that was done here as well. Um, we need to keep an eye on that. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3, 1 Corinthians 12.26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Matthew 5.10-12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24.12 And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3.4 Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Everyone knows we have a violence problem in America, but we're seeing a disturbing new pattern. Violent teens popping up all across the country, and they're consistently getting second, third, even fourth chances, even after committing heinous felonies. In Orlando, Florida, on Tuesday, a 17-year-old student beat his teacher violently, punching her over and over and over again until she was unconscious all because she took away his Nintendo video game during class. He was arrested for felony aggravated battery, but not before telling the teacher he'd kill her on his way out. I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> We're going to stop. Stop. Stupid <laughs> I'm going to kill you. We told you earlier in the week about 18 year old Miles Pfeiffer who shot a police officer execution style last weekend in Philly. And then he committed a carjacking. Well, sources say Pfeffer had been previously charged with making terroristic threats against a high school and was repeatedly suspended from school and then was expelled in ninth grade. He wanted everybody to think he was gangster, even though he lived with his mommy in a million dollar house in the suburbs. He even called his mommy to come pick him up after the crime spree. Neighbors say there were cops around his house all the time. Over in Orange County, Florida on Wednesday, a 19-year-old named Keith Moses went on a shooting spree, shooting five. He killed a 38-year-old before fleeing the scene, then returned five hours later and killed a nine-year-old and a local news reporter before he was arrested. Get on your face. 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 Moses was already a career criminal. This was just at 19. He'd racked up gun charges, aggravated battery, an assault with a deadly weapon, burglary, grand theft. Now, I'm all for second chances, but why are we giving people fourth and fifth chances after we know they're evil? With the horrible mass shootings taking place weekly in the United States, we need to answer the question, why do mass shootings keep happening in America? What does this meaningless violence mean? Will it get worse and worse? as the time of Christ's return draws near? If we think that things are going to get better and that mankind will solve this problem for less violence, we are fooling ourselves. The Bible indicates otherwise. The simple answer to why do mass shootings keep happening in America is, God is being expelled from the essence of American society. Through Supreme Court decisions starting in 1962, God is being expelled from America. 1962, Engel vs. Vital. The removal of prayer in public schools by the Supreme Court. 1963, Abington School District v. Shump. The removal of Bible reading in public schools by the Supreme Court. Contrary to the Lord's commands, America has made it illegal to teach about God and to pray to Him in public schools.
Did you know that Jesus helped his friend come out? In John chapter 11, verse 43, this is what it says. Jesus called out in a loud voice saying, Lazarus, come out. You see, Lazarus was locked up in a cold, dark tomb, wrapped in burial cloths, left for dead. That's exactly what so many Christians and so many churches do to LGBT people. They wrap us up and bind us up and tell us that we need to keep our identity, our true self locked away. But Jesus, upon seeing Lazarus in this state, he says, Lazarus, come out. Step into the light. Take off the cloth. Be who you are. Come alive. I believe that this is what Jesus is speaking to every LGBT person. Come out of the tomb of shame. Take off the chains that have bound you up. Step into the glory of who God made you to be, fearfully and wonderfully made, just as you are. The same spirit that gives life to all people is the same spirit revealed in Jesus Christ and is the same spirit that was at work through Siddhartha Gautama the Buddha and is the same spirit that inspired Prophet Muhammad. Maybe the future of the church and of our world is truly in the hands of what Martin Luther King Jr. called the creatively maladjusted. Maybe minorities, sexual and gender minorities, have something to teach the church about dying to self, about new life, about That is not a sign of God's judgment, okay? Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Hebrews 10, 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. As a sign of his coming, in the end of the age, Jesus said there would be a falling away from the Christian faith, and false teachers would rise up, as we read in Matthew 24, 10 and 11. And then many will fall away, and betray one another, and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The Bible goes on to tell us that these false teachers are Satan's servants, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The last days church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. This is what last day's Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says, Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex, and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3.14-22. through 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, 
and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church, a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and I salve, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved, or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready!
Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.